Turn my boots on and lay some up. I encourage you to, to interrupt me if I uh, put something up on the, on the screen that you don't understand or I use uh, abbreviations or acronyms that uh, you're not familiar with. Uh, Al did a great job of introducing you to some of these uh, here. I notice I've got one on the very first uh, slide uh, here, uh, in fact probably two of them. So we know what MS is, mass spectrometry. Uh, HPLC is the sort of liquid cousin of GC, so this is high performance liquid chromatography. It's the method of choice for separating uh, the arsenic compounds that we find in rice and in many other things as well. And we use a type of mass spectrometer that uh, ionizes the materials that go into the spectrometer by an inductively coupled plasma. So inductively coupled plasma is such a complicated uh, mouthful to, to say that from now on I'm going to refer to this technique as ICP. Uh, and I probably will never say high performance liquid chromatography uh, again either. Uh, I will talk about uh, about HPLC. So I'm going to start a little bit uh, with, uh, with some background here. And I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, to, to juggle two computers here because I, I've got my own computer with uh, a preview uh, of, what's, uh, of what's coming up uh, here. <clears throat> so why should we be uh, concerned uh, about uh, arsenic uh, in rice? So I should perhaps also introduce you to a convention uh, in chemistry, and in fact one that spills over into many other scientific disciplines, and that is that chemists use the name of the element as a kind of shorthand for relevant compounds of the element. So when we say that we're interested in arsenic in rice, or there is arsenic in our foodstuffs, we don't actually mean the element arsenic which is probably not all that toxic because it's not all that bioavailable. You know, it's like a mineral, you know, a rock. So <clears throat> we don't mean there are little gritty pieces of elemental arsenic in our food. We mean there are relevant compounds uh, of arsenic. So you have to sort of do that translation to begin with, that when I say arsenic, what I mean is relevant to, uh, compounds uh, of them. Now, unlike the situation that Al's been dealing with uh, in rice, there are actually only four uh, compounds that are of any significance. There may well be more. I don't think there are many thousands of arsenic-containing compounds in rice. There are, of course, lots of compounds uh, in rice. But in fact, there's only four uh, that turn up in, in measurable uh, concentrations. Two of them are class one non-threshold carcinogens. So the first thing to decode is what do we mean by a non-threshold uh, carcinogen? So I've got this definition on here. You can read that uh, you know, when eventually this gets up uh, uh, online uh, here. But uh, we need to look at this bottom uh, uh, sentence here. Cancer potency is expressed as a cancer slope factor. And the cancer slope factor has this rather horrible convoluted uh, units. Now it's got a minus one out here, so it's the reciprocal of all this stuff. And this is milligrams of the compound, in this case whatever arsenic compound it is, per kilogram of body weight. So that's what BW stands uh, for, uh, per day. And as we normally work in pounds uh, for our weight, you need to uh, bear in mind that uh, one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. So uh, I weigh about 165. I'm going to use my own weight as, a, as an example uh, in the calculations uh, here. So this is an area that can be a little confusing because this milligram per kilogram looks like it's a unit of concentration. When we talk about how much uh, arsenic there might be in rice, we often express that as so many micrograms of the arsenic compound per kilogram of the rice. But this is not. This is per kilogram of your, of your body. Uh, weight uh, here. So first of all, the, the, the non-threshold uh, carcinogen uh, uh, piece uh, here. <clears throat> so non-threshold uh, means that uh, if we plot the risk of something bad happening uh, as a, a function of the consumption uh, of uh, the, uh, the chemical in question in this unit of milligrams per kilogram of body weight per day, then a non-threshold carcinogen uh, is one in which the slope uh, or the line or the curve or whatever shape this is passes through the origin. There is no threshold right, above which the effect takes place and below which it is considered to be completely innocuous. A non-threshold carcinogen would have a horizontal line here 
at zero uh, risk of anything bad happening uh, as the consumption uh, increases. So the thinking at the moment is about these arsenic compounds is there is no dose along here that does not uh, produce a response. Now, at the moment, uh, in this country, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency thinks the acceptable risk for cancer uh, from any source is 1 in 10,000. So the risk uh, we're plotting on this axis here is in these units of 1 in, 1 in 100, 1 in 1,000. So 1 in 10,000 is the current thinking, that that's an acceptable uh, risk. The EPA uh, calculates uh, its concentrations of, let's say, arsenic in drinking water based on least ideas around uh, this being the acceptable uh, upper risk. In Europe, uh, the, uh, the value is, is, uh, is much lower or higher, depending on which way you happen to think about this. The Europeans have an acceptable risk of about 1 in 100, rather than 1 in 10,000. So we're a little more conservative uh, in this, uh, this country here. So we do have a number uh, uh, here uh, for uh, the value, because there is uh, literature uh, that tells us that the slope value is currently thought to be about 3.7, and then at this convoluted unit here, so if you do the math, uh, 1 in 10,000 is 0 0.001. What's the, the, the consumption down here? So th that calculates to be about 0 0.03, 0 0.027 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. So uh, my uh, consumption, before I get to this value here, is a daily consumption of 2 micrograms of uh, arsenic as uh, the more toxic uh, form of arsenic. So that's the background uh, to uh, why we might be concerned, but we need to then uh, overlap that with, well, how much arsenic, how much rice, uh, or how much uh, food do we eat uh, that contains uh, arsenic? Well, as you probably guessed, uh, rice is the foodstuff that contains the most of these toxic uh, or carcinogenic forms uh, of arsenic. So if I eat 45 grams per day, which is a quarter of a cup, then the maximum amount of me, for me, being two micrograms, that was the previous slide. So the concentration uh, of uh, arsenic in rice, if I eat this amount on a daily basis, should be no more than 45 micrograms per kilogram uh, of, the, of the rice, so 44 parts per billion. So I'm going to use PPB from now on rather than micrograms per kilogram because that's a bit of a mouthful uh, as, uh, as well. <clears throat> so... Now we've got to that stage, what you really want to know is, well, how much of these arsenic compounds are there in rice? Is there anything like uh, that higher concentration? Uh, so uh, here on the, on the next uh, slide, uh, this is data taken from the Consumer Reports, or a Consumer Reports article of November uh, 2012. Remember, we're looking at for 44 here. Now, I know you can't uh, read those, but uh, what I've done is I've highlighted uh, one, oops, uh, to do it on here as well, highlighted uh, one particular uh, 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 rice uh, from this data table here. And we're looking at the inorganic uh, arsenic sum uh, here. So uh, just to uh, explain what the, the data uh, here is, we got the lot number uh, of, the, of the material, so identified by its name here. And then we've got the total arsenic in parts per billion, and then we've got the sum of the inorganic uh, arsenic. So roughly speaking, we can say that rice contains inorganic arsenic compounds and organic arsenic compounds. Actually, that's about, about the, the, the size of it. Um, it's the inorganic uh, compounds that are the class one non-threshold carcinogens. And you can see that for this particular uh, sample material I've highlighted here, uh, the numbers are 179, 186, and 165. So that's way above the 44. Uh, that is the threshold value for me if I were to eat rice uh, on a daily uh, basis. <coughs> so we'll perhaps come back to uh, the, the recommendations that this article eventually makes about rice uh, consumption uh, a, little, uh, a little later. So you'll notice, in fact, uh, that uh, the total uh, arsenic content in rice uh, could be considerably uh, higher uh, than that. And for those of you sitting near the, uh, uh, the front, you may be able to see that uh, these numbers are, in fact, quite, uh, quite variable. 
uh, down here, and I'm going to show you some more that illustrate another uh, feature of, the, of these data uh, uh, towards, the, uh, towards the end of the, of the talk. Now, if you're, uh, if you're interested in uh, finding uh, more information about this, if I've piqued your interest about uh, there being toxic compounds uh, in our foodstuffs, then this book uh, tells you everything you want to know about arsenic and rice and then a lot more. The only problem is that it's written mainly for agronomists, so it's not written for consumers, it's not actually written for measurement uh, scientists. The measurement scientists, science is uh, not very prominent, but it tells you a lot about, uh, about why there is uh, arsenic compounds uh, and what might be done about it. Right? A lot of people are very concerned uh, about uh, the world's rice supply, which uh, to summarize is more or less contaminated uh, with arsenic compounds. There is no such thing as arsenic-free rice. Right? Uh, um, <clears throat> and it's uh, fairly recent, uh, published in uh, 2012. So that's, that's a book. Um, this is a journal, so you have to pay for the book, I guess, unless your library has a policy of buying textbooks. Do we have a policy of buying textbooks? <laughs> or is that gone? <laughs> Those were the good old days, uh, right? <laughs> anyway, this is this uh, journal article can be can be downloaded uh, 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 here. Uh, this is also fairly recent, though. The date on here is 2009. It has been updated. Uh, it says this version was published on February uh, 2010. This is about 500 pages long, so I haven't put the. Uh, the last page number uh, uh, here. Uh, this is a monstrous study done in, in Europe. Uh, it has an enormous amount of, uh, uh, of data, um, including a lot of stuff about toxicology uh, and epidemiology, uh, so you can find out some of the background. Unfortunately, um, at least in my opinion, uh, when this study was put together, the data that they collected from all of the European countries that participated is deficient in the fact they didn't really collect data on the different arsenic compounds in the food. And so many of the, uh, of the, the recommendations that are in this, uh, or the opinions that are expressed here, are based on uh, rather fuzzy uh, chemical information, so the analytical information on which this is based is not really all that, uh, all that helpful. <laughs> so the next, um, <clears throat> all right, so this is the Consumer Reports uh, article, uh, and uh, I use this now uh, uh, when I'm talking about this topic with students because uh, I figure that uh, students ought to be able to understand uh, the information that's in an article like, like this and to try to uh, have some understanding of the science behind uh, the recommendations, all right, because uh, it's, it's pretty clear where uh, the writers of this article uh, stand. We don't know who the authors are. They're not identified here, so there are no names associated with this, but they say that their findings show a real need for federal standards for this toxin, meaning the arsenic compounds that uh, are of particular uh, concern. <clears throat> so, as I've tried to indicate, uh, and as Al uh, said, uh, a lot of the discussion and debate around uh, what to do uh, about uh, the situation is underpinned by the provision of reliable information about chemical composition. And so that's sort of one of the definitions of analytical chemistry. Analytical chemists provide reliable information about the chemical composition of relevant materials so that a decision can be taken. Right? So the data has to be useful within the context of the problem that, that's under uh, examination. So we need to know reliable information uh, about the uh, content particularly the inorganic arsenic content uh, in, the, in rice. So you might say, well, you know, why is it necessary to uh, subdivide the arsenic compounds uh, and get information about the inorganic ones? Why not just measure the total arsenic uh, in rice and assume that it's all present as the inorganic uh, form? That's what's done with mercury. So we're concerned also about the mercury content of, uh, of some foodstuffs, mostly fish. And the way that that problem is approached uh, is that we measure the total mercury and we assume that it's all really toxic. And so we base the standards for mercury in food uh, on the idea that all of the compounds that there might be in the fish, whatever they are, uh, are uh, particularly toxic. And here's a very significant difference between arsenic and mercury. So when inorganic mercury compounds get into the biologically active environment, they are methylated. At least most compounds get 
methylated when they get into the environment, and that's true for arsenic. But it turns out that the methyl or the methyl arsenic, sorry, methyl mercury compounds are more toxic than the original inorganic compounds. So it doesn't matter that there's been a methylated transformation. The resulting compound is just as, if not more toxic, than the original compound. But that's not true. Uh, for arsenic. So when arsenic uh, gets into the environment uh, and, is, uh, and is methylated, then the resulting compounds are less toxic. And ultimately, they are completely non-toxic. So there are certain uh, foodstuffs, particularly those of marine uh, origin, where all of the arsenic has been totally methylated through to, in fact, tetramethyl uh, arsenic compounds that are completely harmless as far as we're concerned. So we would uh, grossly uh, overestimate uh, the risk of consuming uh, a foodstuff if we were to measure the total uh, arsenic. So we really need what chemists call speciation analysis. We need to be able to measure the different arsenic compounds in order to be able to accurately assess whether this particular foodstuff is going to be a risk or not based on the inorganic uh, arsenic uh, compound. So another possibility is that we might use uh, a fraction uh, then some sort of factor. Well, you know, 50% of the, of the arsenic is in the toxic form and 50% is not. But the reality is that even in rice, uh, we see variation from anything from 10% of the uh, inorganic uh, fraction uh, up, to, up to 90%. So we don't have regulations concerning arsenic and foodstuffs uh, in this country. In fact, no country in the world, with the possible exception of China, uh, has a regulation concerning arsenic in, uh, in foodstuffs. There's a lot of talk, um, and when the regulations do come, I think it's almost certain that they'll come uh, f formulated in terms of uh, the need for speciation uh, information. In fact, uh, the recognition that uh, exposure to uh, arsenic from food uh, is, a, uh, is a significant uh, source, is only relatively, uh, relatively recent. Until, I don't know, five or six years ago, most uh, people thought that drinking water was the only significant source of arsenic that we had to worry about. And that's particularly people who are drinking groundwater. So if you pull the water up out of your well, then there are parts of the country, in fact, quite a lot of parts of the country, where the groundwater is contaminated with arsenic, almost certainly from natural uh, origins. I mean, we do spread a lot of arsenic-containing chemicals around the environment. As yet, they haven't made their way uh, into the aquifers in any, to any great extent. So when people are worried about arsenic in their groundwater, it's almost certainly of natural origins, come from the minerals uh, in, the, uh, in the gravel uh, in, in there. <clears throat> but we're at, at, uh, at early stages here in estimating uh, the extent to which we're exposed by uh, um, arsenic in our foodstuffs. Uh, and in fact, almost all the estimates that people use in this country, you know, how much arsenic uh, are we eating in, in this country, are based on one study uh, published uh, in 1999. This is it uh, here. It's got this uh, easily understood title. Uh, here it's published in this journal, Food and Chemical uh, Toxicology. Uh, and they examined 40 commodities that they pulled off the supermarket shelves that they thought would deliver 90% of the total dietary inorganic arsenic, and they took four samples of each of these, and they measured the total arsenic, and they measured the inorganic uh, arsenic. So uh, that's, uh, that's what they did uh, with these. So slides on my computer here are not changing as fast um, as, they are, <coughs> as they are there. So uh, as I said, all uh, data, or many of the, of the studies about what we eat are based on this. Unfortunately, the results for uh, the analysis of the rice are wrong. There's no other word to use uh, for, <laughs> for, for this. Um, and the reason that we know they're wrong is that we know there are only four compounds containing arsenic in rice. They account for 99% of all of the arsenic in rice. And I'll show you the formula later for those of you who've got a chemical background. I know there's at least one a uh, person apart from Al in the audience who has a chemistry background. So these compounds uh, are uh, the inorganic arsenic, which in fact is two compounds, arsenate and arsenite. Uh, it's monomethyl uh, arsenic and dimethyl, the, uh, the, the mono one with one methyl group and the one with two. 
So uh, if we add together uh, the inorganic arsenic content and the arsenic from this compound and the arsenic from this compound, we should get an arsenic concentration that is equal to the total arsenic. So uh, this column here shows the, uh, the total arsenic concentration. The units are parts per billion micrograms per kilogram. And you'll see that, in fact, the sum of the inorganic and the monomethyl and the dimethyl uh, is 55, but the total is 335. So 84% of the arsenic is missing in this analysis. 44% is missing here, 38. So only for one rice sample out of four, uh, and you'll see they've got quite different uh, total uh, concentrations, uh, did they manage to get anything that might be considered to be the right uh, answer? So the one study that many of, uh, of the subsequent work is based on is unfortunately quite seriously uh, flawed. And so here is uh, uh, a more recent publication in which uh, they did in fact use the data from the previous paper, which I'll call the Schuf uh, et al. So this has got a, a rather uh, more fancy title, Probabilistic Modeling of Dietary Arsenic Exposure and Dose and Evaluation uh, with the 2003-2004 uh, NHAES uh, data. That's the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, so data from the NIH that's in the public uh, domain. And so they took this data about, you know, what do people eat, how much of these different foodstuffs do they eat, and then they convoluted that with the data from the Schuf et al. paper about how much arsenic is there in each of these different foodstuffs, and they came up uh, with this pie chart, no pun intended, I guess, uh, to show uh, that, in fact, the biggest source uh, of uh, inorganic arsenic in the American diet uh, is what they call vegetables. They separate out rice, and you see that that's down here at 17% uh, of, uh, uh, of the pie chart uh, uh, here. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, they've got beer and wine here at 12%, uh, and they've got uh, other grains uh, over here at 11 percent. This is fruit and fruit juice uh, here, and uh, then we've got poultry, uh, meats, eggs, fish. No, sorry, no fish on, on here. This is inorganic arsenic. Fish doesn't have any inorganic arsenic in it to, uh, to speak of, uh, and um, whatever is under the, under the others uh, here. So this data may or may not be accurate because uh, we know that the rice data is not, is not correct. Nowadays, I think uh, we would consider that rice is the single largest source of inorganic arsenic in the American uh, diet, because we all have different consumption uh, patterns. Some of us each eat a lot more rice than, than others. So I suspect that if we were to redo this data with more accurate analyses about the, the speciation, we would get a slightly different uh, looking uh, pie chart um, uh, here. Uh, they do actually come up with some numbers uh, here. They do calculate what they think a mean total exposure uh, from food uh, uh, is, and it's 0.38 micrograms per kilogram of body weight uh, per day. And that's 14 times higher than they calculate from the drinking water. So this is one of the reasons that we think that uh, drinking water is not really a major source in the U.S. diet, that food uh, is that when you look at the, uh, the pattern of consumptions, uh, you get uh, that food gives you much more arsenic than does, uh, does drinking water. The inorganic arsenic exposure is 0.05 micrograms per kilogram of body weight per day. So remember we were down uh, around 0.027 micrograms per kilogram body weight per day, corresponding to the 1 in 10,000. So this article calculates that, in fact, on average, taken over all of the uh, people in the USA that this study uh, covered, that we're about at the 1 in 5,000 risk of getting uh, cancer uh, from the arsenic in, in, our, in our foodstuffs. Oh. We're eating more uh, than the uh, EPA thinks is, uh, is an acceptable risk. All right, now, now I want to, do, to sort of dig in a little more to the, uh, to the analytical chemistry uh, side of this, and I'm probably going to speed up a little bit here because it gets a little technical uh, at, uh, at times. But as I said, don't hesitate to, uh, uh, to stop me. So these are the chemicals that we're interested in, uh, in measuring. So these are the, uh, the arsenic-containing 
uh, compounds. They're not very complicated, as you can see. There's arsenite shown without the hydrogens uh, here. This is actually arsenous acid. Uh, for those of you with a chemical background, so this is a weak uh, acid, uh, as is this species. This is arsenate. These are the two non-threshold class I uh, carcinogens. This is the monomethyl. We just substitute one of these oxygens or OH groups uh, with a methyl group. This is the dimethyl. Uh, this compound exists, so we put three methyl groups on here. We get trimethyl arsine oxide. Many bacteria uh, can produce this compound. It, uh, it evaporates out of soil, so we have a pressure-treated wood deck and arsenic from your pressure-treated wood is getting into the soil, then the soil bacteria will probably uh, methylate right the way through here, uh, and this stuff will evaporate out of the soil. I don't know how toxic this stuff is, so don't get down underneath your deck and sniff the, uh, the soil. That would be actually a foolish thing to do because the wood dust that's underneath your deck has a very, very high concentration of arsenic, and you definitely don't want to get that into your nasal uh, uh, passages. Um, but I don't think there's any danger from uh, the bacterial uh, action re releasing this into the environment. And then, as I said, uh, some organisms, particularly fish uh, and other uh, seafood um, marine organisms, can produce this compound, tetramethyl arsonium, but it's an intermediate, and we see almost no concentrations of this. Uh, where it ends up is either as arsenobetaine or arsenocholine. So uh, this is chemist notation. This little uh, kink in the, in the line here means there's a CH2 group uh, here. So this uh, group uh, has been derivatized. Uh, one of the hydrogens uh, on that has been replaced with, uh, with this carboxylic acid group. This is called arsenobetaine, sometimes referred to as seafood arsenic. This is the stuff that's present in thousands of parts per billion uh, in almost every food, uh, seafood that you eat. Uh, and it's completely harmless as far as we're concerned. We do not metabolize this. It's excreted in our urine completely unchanged. Uh, this uh, closely related molecule uh, occurs at lower concentrations but still quite high. Uh, also occurs in seafood, also uh, non-toxic as far as we, as we know. <clears throat> so the species that we're interested uh, in measuring are the so-called arsenite, I'm going to use this abbreviation here, arsenic in the 3-plus oxidation state, arsenic in the 5-plus oxidation state, the inorganic species, the MMA, and the DMA. These are the four compounds that are in, in rice. We want to be able to, to measure uh, those accurately. Uh, and so um, it's relevant to ask how well can we do that, knowing that at least one of the articles we looked at, this 1999 Schuf et al. paper, didn't do a very uh, good job. Uh, and so the answer to this, uh, this question uh, is, uh, as you might imagine, not very well. Uh, and that's not based on the, on the article that I just showed you. It's based on this um, uh, report here. Uh, this is what we call IMEP 107. In tiny little letters down here, uh, it says total and inorganic arsenic in rice. So these IMEP uh, studies uh, are studies uh, of uh, so-called heavy metals. Don't like that term. IUPAC doesn't like the term, but it still appears in the literature. So this is all about arsenic in rice, all right? In particular, uh, measurements of the total and the inorganic arsenic uh, in rice. Now, there isn't a date on that, but on the next uh, slide, uh, there is a, a 2011 date, because, in fact, this is a monstrous uh, report. It's got all the raw data uh, in it. You can get it for free from the, from the website of this organization. But the, uh, the organizers of the trial... Uh, wrote a summary of it in this journal called Trends in Analytical Chemistry. It's not really a magazine, but it's sort of like a, a magazine. It's a magazine for analytical uh, chemists. You do have to have sort of bachelor's level analytical chemistry, chemistry to understand what goes uh, on in here. Uh, but the data are summarized uh, here. The study was done in, in 2010. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a little bit about this uh, study because I think it illustrates quite well uh, why it is that we're still interested uh, in this problem uh, of uh, what are the concentrations of arsenic compounds uh, in rice. So uh, briefly, what they did was they made uh, a pseudo-reference material. So they, uh, the organizers of this study uh, <coughs> went out in Aberdeen, Scotland, as it happens, and they bought 10 kilograms of rice from the supermarket. And then they ground it and dried it and milled it and all kinds of other stuff. And eventually, uh, they put the homogeneous stuff uh, in 20-gram lots in, in bottles. They tested it to see whether it was homogeneous and stable. And then they sent it to seven expert labs. 
six of whom were able to uh, provide results for the inorganic arsenic uh, content. And then they invited labs from all around the world to partake in a so-called collaborative, uh, it's not actually a collaborative study, technically it's a so-called proficiency test. So anybody who volunteered was sent a 20 gram bottle and some instructions and told, analyze this material by any procedure that you would normally use in your lab and tell us the results. And the results were all collected in. And then, as Al indicated, the statistical analysis uh, kicked in. And I can show you uh, just a little bit of, uh, of that in a way that I hope is, is reasonably easy to, to understand. So this is the uh, inorganic uh, arsenic uh, results. So the expert labs decided uh, that the average concentration or the concentration in this material was 0 0.107 milligrams per kilogram, in other words, 107 micrograms per kilogram. And they came up with a plus or minus term, about a 95% uh, confidence interval. So they were 95% confident that the real value was somewhere in this green line here. So what we've got a plot of is the, is the lab uh, result uh, as a function of the lab number down here, which what I've put this bar over the top here, uh, is the number of the lab. So each of these little diamonds represents a lab result, uh, and the, the, the whisker, the, the vertical line, uh, indicates uh, the, some estimate of the uncertainty of the measurement as reported by the lab. So they were asked to, to report the uncertainty. And they're, they're plotted uh, in order from the lowest value uh, to the highest value. What you don't see uh, here is there's about four or five little arrows down here that show that there were some labs who couldn't find any arsenic at all uh, in this material. And then there were some labs over here who thought it was actually greater than whatever this number is up, uh, up here, 200 uh, uh, here. And then there's a range of, uh, of values uh, in here. So you're really looking for where do the little blue diamonds fall uh, within the green uh, bars uh, here. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the statistics. The red lines uh, are another slightly more lenient uh, interpretation of the, of the data. Uh, but even then, you'll see that there's a significant number of these labs uh, outside. And these were all labs who thought they knew what they were doing, right? They volunteered to take part in this study. They are labs that have experience of analyzing uh, materials like uh, rice for arsenic at these kinds of concentrations. So commercial or academic? Both. <laughs> Yeah, so a mixture of commercial labs, so-called national metrology laboratories, so that is things like uh, NIST that was mentioned earlier in this country, the laboratory of the government chemist uh, in the UK. So every nation uh, pretty much that is concerned about stuff in food has a so-called national metrology laboratory. Most of them took part. When you look in the article, you get a, a, a breakdown so you know how many labs from how many countries, how many different, you know, there were many tens of countries uh, involved uh, here. Uh, so this is a, a, a sort of uh, text summary. I'm going to skip over that because there's a visual uh, summary uh, here. So even though this looks a little complicated, um, the, 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 the colored bar and, and, and the key uh, is, uh, is, is here. So the, the organizers calculate all kinds of statistical functions and so on. They have something called the zeta score. And essentially, uh, and you can see it defined uh, uh, here, but essentially uh, they classified the results of the labs as either unsatisfactory, questionable, or satisfactory. And so this bar here shows that according to the organizers of the trial, it's not my reinterpretation uh, of it, uh, only 57% of the laboratories got a satisfactory result, and therefore 43% of the participating labs got a result that the organizers said was dodgy, questionable, uh, or was unsatisfactory. And so, so that's the status of where sort of modern analytical chemistry is in terms of its ability uh, to measure these uh, compounds in rice upon which we're going to make some decisions about legislation uh, of how much uh, arsenic we should be allowing uh, uh, in the rice. So you begin to see, I think, what the problem uh, is uh, here. And as Al said, or indicated, analysis is difficult, right? It's not easy. It's not just lifting the lid and putting the sample in and pressing the button and getting the numbers, right? 
this is a real challenge. We're pushing the boundary of the capabilities of modern instrumental measurements, and we're not there uh, yet. We, in my view, anyway, we're not at a stage where we do have uh, reliable measurements. And that's why people like myself, who've got the sort of perhaps a little more time on our hands, can stop and work on this problem. Why is it that we can't get the right answer uh, for these arsenic compounds uh, in rice? And in fact, I've spent several years looking at it. I haven't spent them. My graduate student, uh, <laughs> Tiffany, has spent a lot of time trying uh, to, get to, the, to get to the bottom of this. And although I won't give you the full story, I'll sort of hint that things are going reasonably well, uh, maybe. Uh, so hints is just about all I can give you. Okay, so um, this is um, for the librarians in the audience. Do we have any of those uh, here, uh, here this afternoon? So this is the Journal of Analytical Atomic Spectrometry. It's a key journal uh, in our area because we're using atomic uh, spectrometry um, to, make the, uh, to make these measurements. Um, this journal publishes uh, six review articles every year called the Atomic Spectroscopy Updates. Uh, here you'll notice they have some really well-known scientists who write uh, 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 for these. Uh, this is a, a cover page uh, of the journal. Uh, I chose this entirely at random. Um, this is our own article featured on the cover just by, by chance. And actually, I took that picture myself. Um, this is the garden, if that's the right word, uh, of the International Visitor's Residence at the Agricultural University of Maimanshing in Bangladesh. So uh, the National Science Foundation very kindly gave me some money to go around the world investigating uh, arsenic uh, contamination uh, issues. As you may know, Bangladesh is the country that has the worst groundwater contamination problem. So I spent uh, several weeks uh, uh, visiting uh, uh, there. Now, you can't read the text uh, here. I just want to pull uh, out uh, this one um, sentence from this uh, particular uh, review article to show that, in fact, this is something that the community is seriously engaged with. So um, I have to say, it wasn't me that wrote this sentence, right? So, you know, as the author of a short guide to writing about chemistry, I would not have written uh, this, this sentence. But whoever did write it said of particular interest this year, at least in terms of the numbers of publications, well, duh, what else would uh, you uh, base your comment uh, on, would seem to be, is... Uh, the determination of arsenic in rice. Phew, we got to the end of the sentence uh, uh, eventually. So in this review article, um, we and my colleagues here, we reviewed uh, the content of 246 uh, articles. 40 of them uh, concerned the measurement of arsenic species in rice. So this is uh, the literature on elemental speciation. And eight of these publications were concerned with arsenic uh, in rice. And they probably came from eight different research groups around the world. So there is a lot of uh, activity uh, going on uh, at the moment. So uh, I just want to sort of dig a little uh, into, the, uh, into some of this work to, to give you a sort of flavor for uh, what uh, people are, are doing. I, I, I put this slide up because I think it's a great choice of journal to publish the results uh, of, uh, of the research. So this is actually the Journal of Hazardous Materials. Uh, and uh, this is the title of the article, The Speciation of Arsenic in Rice. Uh, this is a Brazilian research group. This is often what we find in the literature, that a particular group in a particular country tries to uh, estimate what the situation in their particular country uh, is by going out and buying rice off the supermarket uh, shelves. Um, that's a... Well, I perhaps won't say anything about that at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as you perhaps gathered, uh, validating the method, knowing that we got the right answer, is, uh, is a significant uh, problem. Uh, uh, here And as Al indicated, one way that you can do this uh, is to add uh, a known amount of the analyte at the beginning of the, of the, of the procedure and then analyze uh, it at the end of the procedure. And I think you said 10 ppm. If you add 10 ppm, you've got to find 10 ppm. So that's, how, that's one way in which uh, people can validate their methods. The other is to actually analyze a reference material. So a reference material is a material which has been analyzed by a large number of reputable uh, um, analytical chemists, different uh, groups may be working in, in a government agency, and it comes with a certificate, so they're called certified uh, reference materials, and the certificate tells you uh, what the chemical constituents are uh, in the material. 
The problem uh, is, uh, as uh, in, in the next uh, slide here, is in fact there's only one rice reference material in the entire world that is certified for the arsenic species. And it's only been available for the last couple of years. It comes from Japan. It is available in this country. It's very expensive. Well, uh, all things are relative, right? It costs hundreds of dollars. Um, whereas uh, most of the community uh, has been using a material from NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. They make a standard reference material, uh, 1568A. It's a rice flour. It's certified for the total arsenic content. So you can buy from NIST for slightly less than you can buy this Japanese uh, stuff. You can buy a rice material. It's actually rice from Arkansas uh, that's been carefully prepared and analyzed. Uh, and we know that it's got 290 uh, plus or minus 30 parts per billion uh, in this. So the approach of this Brazilian group and many other uh, groups uh, is to analyze this material uh, by their method, um, and then they add up the species. Does it add up to 290? And then they compare uh, their values with other analyses reported in the literature. And I think that's what's shown on the next slide here. Well, you can't read uh, that, I'm afraid. It's even less in focus than... And it uh, looks like on the uh, on the screen, which is a is a shame. So this is a table uh, taken from their uh, 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 results, and what's along the top here is species uh, recovery, uh, the uh, inorganic uh, arsenic uh, species here, the DMA and the MMA. So I, I've redrawn that, uh, I think, on the on the next uh, slide uh, uh, here. So this is taken from this uh, Brazilian uh, article uh, by Batista et al. Uh, and these are their data uh, along, the, along uh, here. And uh, this, the rest of these uh, data are in that table. So this reference number here is, refers to the reference number at the end of their, of their article. So they went to the literature and they found, I don't know, 10, 15, uh, previously published uh, results of this uh, of this material, and I put on uh, on top of this a more recent article uh, from a group in Austria that I think does really really good work, and I put on our own results uh, here with some trepidation because you'll see that Tiffany's results are not really uh, in accordance with uh, what you see by running your up, eye up and down uh, this uh, column or these columns here. So by looking at these num the agreement vertically in these columns, we're looking to see you know, what is the agreement between previously published uh, data in the literature for the analysis of this reference material. Right? So we're assuming that this NIST reference material doesn't change its speciation composition as it's been sent around the world from one place to, to another. And we think that's a reasonable assumption because we know that none of the arsenic compounds are volatile unless you happen to heat the material. So uh, this is one of these uh, analyses where you mustn't dry the material and then analyze it. You have to dry it in a separate experiment and then, uh, and then analyze it. So you'll see that even these, you know, these published results are, are sort of straying around uh, all, over the, uh, uh, all over the place. And I think the next... Uh, 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 yeah, I tried to overlay on this. Uh, this is an interesting uh, data set uh, here. You'll notice that uh, the numbers uh, in this uh, column from, from reference 28 really do seem to be out of line uh, uh, here. And when I first used this data table at a conference, I used it to point out that there really is you know, a lot of variation in these numbers, and that's one of the reasons I think that we need some more work. But then, uh, when I was writing a review article uh, last fall, I actually went to each of these to actually see what the authors had done. Um, you probably guessed what happens when I went to reference 28. These numbers are not the right numbers, right? So Batista et al., when they went to reference 28, copied the wrong line from the <laughs> table of data from the authors of reference 28. All right, so now that, that is corrected now because my own review article points that out. Um, but that's another uh, issue that we have to deal with, right? Not everything that you read in the refereed scientific literature is correct. Now, I blame the reviewers of this paper, right? So this Journal of Hazardous Materials must have sent the manuscript out to reviewers who should have found uh, this mistake in reviewing uh, the material. So, so I, blame, I blame the reviewers. Well, we can get into a discussion about you know, how much 
Uh, should we be paying people to review uh, articles for the scientific literature? What is the expectation? And, uh, and so on. So there was a data table there of, what, 15 results? All of the same analysis. So 15 publications, essentially the same analytical problem. And in fact, since then, I found another 25. There are about 40 papers in the original scientific literature over the last 10 years, all of which report the analysis of these four arsenic species uh, in rice. So there are lots of papers describing the same analysis. Why on earth is that? Right? Well, I think the answer is that none of them has got it quite right yet. Right? They're all wrong. Well, that's perhaps putting it a little harshly, but this is one of the reasons uh, for research in analytical chemistry. We continue to refine the measurements because what's gone before, we're not able to get the answer quite right. And so we build uh, on this previous work, we refine the methodology, and hopefully we converge on something that the community agrees does in fact give the right answer. And then we have a method for measuring these four arsenic species uh, in rice. But we're not there yet. We're sort of in the middle uh, of that. We know there's a problem, and we know that there is a, a, a government agency, probably somewhere, wanting to use this information to create legislation. But there's a gap uh, uh, here. So the next slides that I'm going to sort of click through are really to sort of um, uh, to, to il illustrate that that there are um, sort of problems um, that are um, sort of overcome incrementally, right? So the instrument manufacturers are continually improving instruments. So the next generation of ICPMS instrument, you know, is a better uh, instrument. It's more accurate, possibly less prone to interferences. This is a difficult analysis, right? So the analytes, what we're looking for, present at very low concentrations, you know, tens, hundreds of parts per billion. The rice matrix is very complicated. It's a horrible, starchy, gooey material. You can't attack it with aggressive chemicals because you want to extract these four arsenic compounds without changing them, right? We don't want to convert all of the arsenic compounds to, let's say, inorganic, because that would grossly overestimate what the uh, toxic compounds uh, uh, are. Of course, everybody wants to use less expensive uh, equipment, and we want to do things faster, cheaper, uh, and, uh, and so on. So all of these um, features uh, of the method can, in fact, uh, give rise uh, to problems. So there are problems with the sample preparation that I've hinted at. There are problems with the separation of the compounds. There are problems with this instrument as a detector for arsenic compounds. There are problems with uh, the calibration uh, functions. There are problems with, uh, with the validation. Uh, and then uh, there are, uh, as we say, applications to real uh, samples. And we know that for the NIST material, still can't get the, uh, get the right answer. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to let you sort of run your eye uh, over these. These will be available, um, uh, I guess, for people who want to look at the, uh, uh, at the difficulties uh, of the individual uh, methods. So I, I'm, I'm making some critical comments about what's in the literature. It's, of course, it's easy uh, to do uh, these things. But I think unless people do make critical comments, um, we're not going to see any improvement here. And part of the problem with the chromatography is that researchers don't do a good job of citing previous work or discussing the optimization or disclosing what deficiencies in the prior work they've addressed. And uh, so it means at the moment I think progress is really slow because when you read a, a published article in this, in this area, it's often really difficult to know what is it that about this article that's actually a significant advance over the previously published work. I shouldn't have to do that as a reader of, uh, of this article. So I, I'm sort of getting on my soapbox a little uh, here, um, and I can do that because I'm coming to the end of my career, and I've been writing these ASU reviews, you know, these update articles, for over 25 years now. So every year I read large numbers of publications uh, in this area, and I think that there are problems uh, in the quality, uh, and it's not, it, it could be easily uh, uh, addressed. Um, so <clears throat> just give you a, a flavor for the sort of range of things that are, that are going on uh, here. So uh, this is the, uh, the, the sort of the, um, 
the sort of guts, the kitchen sink area, if you like. This is the type of chromatography and the conditions. And there are enormous variations. So at the moment, so this is an anion exchange material. This is done at room temperature. There's so-called isocratic elution. The mobile phase composition in this chromatography experiment doesn't change. Um, and you'll see that we've got arsenobetaine at the front, or maybe you can see, uh, and uh, arsenic-5 right at the end. So this is at the beginning of the experiment. This is at the end of the experiment. So uh, in the next slide, uh, this is a 2010 paper. So completely different chromatographic method, different mobile phase composition, uh, maybe isocratic at room temperature. But now arsenobetaine is the last one to elute. And the inorganic arsenic-5, which was the last one in the previous slide, is now the first one. So even as late or as early as you know, whoops, um, 2010, and I think the previous article was 2011, we don't have any agreement at all on what the best chromatographic separation is. So the very heart of the analytical method, the separation of these compounds, we don't have any agreement. We've got one research group uh, having a method that produces the, the peaks in completely the, uh, the opposite uh, order. Well, maybe there's, there's room for more than one uh, uh, method uh, here, but it would be nice to see the community converging a little uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this area. Um, this, I think, is a 2012 uh, paper. Represents, I think, the best that I've seen so far. The four arsenic compounds all separated, baseline separation between them uh, within, uh, within four uh, minutes. And uh, so if that's the best that I've seen uh, in, in the published article, this is uh, from our own uh, work. So this is Tiffany's uh, work here. So we've got the four arsenic uh, compounds really well separated uh, uh, here. Uh, and uh, for, uh, I guess, Owl's benefit here, I show that uh, chloride, uh, which is a potential interference in this method, um, if it coelutes with one of these arsenic compounds, is in fact separated. <laughs> and a non-retained component is uh, running at the solvent front, but our inorganic arsenic-3 is not running at this, the solvent uh, front. So this is unpublished uh, work, uh, but I, I think it is publishable because uh, this is uh, as good as it gets, I think, so far in terms of, uh, of, of the separation. All right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to jump over, uh, over this is more technical uh, stuff to do with um, uh, uh, problems with calibration, with interferences. So that, that the message here is there are lots of potential uh, interferences uh, here in the, in the method, which is the reason I think that everybody finds it so difficult uh, to do this. So when you look at the, at the detailed uh, chemistry, uh, both uh, on the lab bench and inside the, uh, the instrument, uh, there are lots of things uh, that, get in the, uh, that get in the way. Um, there's no agreement on sample preparation uh, uh, procedures, so people are using uh, ultrasonic assisted extraction and microwave assisted, so it's not US, you know, not the United States and Massachusetts, it's two analytical techniques, ultrasound assisted and microwave uh, 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 assisted. Um, there is the problem of what to do with the starch gets in the way uh, of, the, of the analysis. Um, if you try to separate, there's a danger that you lose some of the arsenic uh, compounds. So uh, it's, a, uh, it's a problem uh, here. So gratuitous advice to the analytical chemists uh, in the audience uh, here. So I want to finish up by going back uh, to uh, what may be uh, another real serious uh, uh, problem uh, in, this, uh, in this analysis. So this is an extract from the table in the consumer reports. Uh, article, and I want to draw your attention uh, to these numbers uh, down here. So uh, this is organic Texmati white uh, rice from Texas. There are three different lots of this material, so it's got exactly the same labeling on the outside of the, of the packet. You might therefore think that the arsenic content of this material might be the same, right? So we're going to get a number for the inorganic uh, arsenic content or the total arsenic content of this material. But just look at these numbers. So here's lot one, 330 parts per billion. Lot two, 448 parts per billion. Lot three, 917 parts per billion. This is supposed to be the same material. All right, so now that you know uh, about how difficult it is to make the analysis, 
you might say, well, maybe the lab that was doing this analysis you know, didn't really know what they were doing. That's putting it rather harshly. You know, maybe they were caught out by some of these interference effects that we know about, but they uh, are not up on the most recent uh, literature. Or if these numbers are, in fact, accurate analyses, it means that this material could have anything from 917 to 330. So supposing the law said you can't sell uh, rice that has more than 400 parts per billion total arsenic. So what do you do with this material? One bag passes, this bag maybe passes, this bag definitely fails. So this, I think, a real uh, issue here. We have to get to the bottom of the variation uh, here. Is this a sampling problem? Is this really a variation? Three bags sitting next to each other on the supermarket shelves really have this different concentration. How is that going to be uh, taken into account when we start to, uh, to check whether manufacturers uh, are in compliance with whatever the regulation might be? Well, the slightly better news, I, if you've been looking uh, around this uh, slide here, the, the inorganic uh, arsenic numbers are much less variable uh, here from about 83 uh, up to 100 and, uh, 102. We could probably live with that sort of variation, but we definitely can't live with this kind of, uh, of, uh, of variation. So uh, I'm going to finish up with a couple of extracts from Chemical and Engineering News, so another magazine for chemists, not really meant for the general uh, readership. This is a little article uh, from 2012. Uh, this is the, is the headline here, Cautionary Tale for Food Analysis. And this is the subheading, Inappropriate Methods Skewed Results for Arsenic in Apple Juice. And you thought skewer was, an Ameri was a British word, right? <laughs> so here it is, right? So skewed uh, results. And I've highlighted uh, this here. The methods used by some labs to measure the arsenic in juice can yield results that are biased uh, high. And then blah, 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 when the FDA measured the samples. So this is the uh, arsenic in fruit juice uh, issue of a couple of years ago that Dr. Oz uh, got a lot of mileage uh, out of uh, by telling the nation that its children were being poisoned by the arsenic uh, in fruit juice. Well, maybe they are, maybe they're, they're not. But if we can't agree on what the analytical uh, methods are telling us, then we've still got a long way to go before we know whether the fruit juice is, quote, safe uh, to drink uh, or, uh, or not. Uh, and in much the same uh, issue, uh, Chemical Engineering News 2012, uh, we know now that the Food and Drug Administration is looking at uh, arsenic uh, in rice. This uh, work started uh, in response to the data and consumer reports that I've just been uh, showing you. Uh, and you'll see that they say that the inorganic arsenic average between 3.5 and 6.7 micrograms per serving, which is consistent with the data published last week in consumer reports. I haven't been to the FDA website for a while to look. Last time I went, it just said, uh, we're working on the problem more results will, uh, are coming uh, in, uh, in due course. So thank you for listening to this. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. <laughs> so there's a question over there. Do we get the lights uh, on? Guess not. Yeah. Right, so the question is, why is there so much arsenic uh, in rice compared with, uh, with other, uh, other f and other foods? Right. So first of all, rice is the foodstuff that's, that's got by far and away the most of the uh, toxic arsenic forms. Fish has much higher concentrations, but it's all present as arsenobetaine. And that's come from the marine environment. So marine animals process large volumes of seawater, and they extract the arsenic from the seawater, which is present at a few parts per billion, and they bio-concentrate uh, this, but they metabolize it to these other forms. So why is there so much arsenic in, in, uh, in rice? So there's, there's arsenic compounds in the soil, and rice, unfortunately, appears to be one of those plants uh, that is tolerant. Uh, that is, it can take up arsenic from the soil, but it doesn't actually harm the growth 
uh, of the plant. It doesn't seem to do anything with it, but unfortunately it shunts it into the grain. Right? If it was in the, the, the rice straw, the stem of the plant, we wouldn't be so, so concerned. Now there's, there's debate amongst the plant chemists at the moment as to whether rice is a plant that can metabolize arsenic and therefore produce the methylated compounds. My reading of the literature at the moment is that most plant scientists think that rice cannot do that. And so the compounds that are appearing in rice have come from the soil. So there's a background concentration of inorganic uh, arsenic in all soils, a few parts per million, depending on the underlying uh, geology of the, of the area. But in this country, we're growing rice on fields that were previously used to grow cotton. And we used huge concentration or huge amounts of arsenic-containing agrochemicals during the cotton production process. So the dimethyl compound, which is also called cacodylic acid and was, incidentally, a constituent of Agent Blue, cacodylic acid is a herbicide, an insecticide. You know, it's an arsenic compound. It's toxic. It kills a lot of life forms. So... Uh, cotton was sprayed with cacodylic acid, and the residue of that is in the soil. Rice is grown under conditions which is, you know, the worst possible for mobilizing chemicals out of the soil because it's grown under flooded, anaerobic uh, conditions. So the thinking predominantly amongst plant scientists is that the dimethyl compounds come from the soil, and it's particularly high for those uh, countries that are growing rice in the former cotton fields. That's compounded in this country because we sprayed uh, arsenic acid on the cotton to kill it and desiccate it to make it easier to be mechanically harvested. So we gave the cotton fields a double whammy uh, of arsenic containing uh, compounds as part of the harvesting process. And so we're dealing with the residue uh, of these agricultural uh, chemicals. I don't know why the dimethyl compound is so readily taken up, but arsenate um, and arsenite, the plant is fooled because arsenate looks a lot like phosphate uh, to a plant. They're in the same group in the periodic uh, table. So one of the reasons that plants will take up uh, arsenate is they have a, a, a metabol metabolic route or an uptake pathway for phosphate. And so arsenic gets in that way. So it's, the answer to your question is it's these compounds are in the soil already. Rice is particularly good at taking them up, and we grow rice under conditions that is, helps mobilize the materials from the soil. Do you think there's a role, that politics plays a role in any of these standards or, or difficulty in setting these standards, or is it just... I'm thinking of, I don't know if the rice industry would have some sort of input into what the are. Right, so the question is, are there politics uh, in, involved here? Does the rice uh, industry uh, have a strong lobby? Well, I'm sure that they do. So I have to say I don't know the answer to, uh, to that uh, question. Uh, the Consumer Reports article didn't reach out to that many rice manufacturers they did get hold uh, of somebody who makes uh, baby foods. And that's, I think, is perhaps the most serious um, issue here um, because a lot of infant food is 100% rice. And so there's no loss of arsenic uh, when the rice is converted into pureed uh, forms. And so, and children... It's thought that children are more at risk, and that is that the, the, the number, the 3.7 that is sort of, of for the slope factor, that's a lower number for, for young, uh, young children. Nobody really knows, of course, because the experiment is really difficult to, to do. So I have to say, I don't know um, what the politics uh, here are. I, I think that, the, that governments uh, or the appropriate agencies are hesitating um, to come out with these legislations because of the measurement uh, issues. 
that's, that's where the stumbling block is because um, we can't show that we can get good numbers. And I think that would be an immediate criticism. If you were a rice manufacturer or purveyor, you would immediately uh, point to the fact that the literature shows that we can't yet measure this reliably. So you can't tell me that my rice doesn't meet the government standards because you don't have analytical methods that are good enough uh, to do that uh, yet. So that's, that's one problem. On a personal note, I, I would hope that these uh, regulations do come in even before uh, the, uh, the analytical methods get sorted out. That would put the pressure on the rice growers to start manufacturing or providing arsenic-free rice or low arsenic rice, and I would like to see labels like that on the outsides of the package. Question. So questions about are there any other uh, foods that we, we have to, to, to worry about? Um, so the answer to that is I, I think the only one is hijiki. <laughs> right? So hijiki is some sort of seaweed or sea vegetable. So seaweed contains really high concentrations of arsenic. And in fact... The predominant uh, compounds in seaweed are neither uh, the methylated nor the inorganic. They are arsenosugars. So they are sugar compounds that, to which uh, arsenic has been uh, tacked onto the side chain of the sugar ring. Now, the thinking at the moment is that arsenosugars are not toxic. But it's difficult to tell because when we eat them, we do metabolize them. So when you eat seaweed, your urine contains high concentrations of arsenic compounds that look as though you're being poisoned uh, by inorganic arsenic because we do metabolize them. So there is uh, some suggestions that these seaweeds are not as innocuous as, uh, as, we might, as we might think. One has to be a little careful sometimes reading the literature because often people will say things like, we need more studies of the potential toxicity of the arsenic compounds in seaweed because they're trying to generate uh, a strong case to go to some government agency to get funding uh, for it. But that is the reality, that I think. Now, the particular case of hijiki um, is that it does contain a high concentration of the inorganic compound. So it's one of the few other uh, things that we eat uh, that does have a, a high concentration. So my advice is go easy on the hijiki. I think it's probably used as a food additive rather than as a sort of staple in the diet, but I don't know for sure. Maybe somebody else uh, does, but it's the only one. Everything else is sufficiently low concentrations that you don't have to worry. I question it over here. I can hear you. It's okay. Okay. In that um, they failed to cite previous research, do you have any idea why that might be? So the question is that I said that one of the problems with the, with the published literature is that researchers often don't do a good job of citing uh, previous uh, work. And the question is, well, why, why might that, that be? <clears throat> All right. So... Um, let me perhaps be a little cynical uh, in, in the answer is, <clears throat> I, I think that, the, that a lot of scientists, particularly those uh, in what we might call developing countries, are under very severe pressure to publish their research and to publish their research in journals uh, which are picked up by the various citing agencies. So they will appear in PubMed or web of science or the um, various um, databases that indicate that the journal can start to build an impact factor. And so <clears throat> one way that you can um, appear to have done something uh, new <clears throat> is not to do a very good job of comparing what it is that you've done with what's available previously. So 
<clears throat> and so and this may be over over cynical. The other uh, answer to your question is, well, the scientists are sloppy. That may be true, or it may be that they don't have the access that I have through the web of science, say, to the, the previously published literature. I, I guess maybe sometimes I forget that not everybody can instantly search the world's uh, literature in the way that, uh, that I can do uh, here, and probably everybody on your campuses uh, can do. So are there any ways that librarians could could help? I think there undoubtedly there is if you are asked. So <laughs> so somehow you have to get the word out to your active researchers that you're prepared to help with the writing of the introduction uh, to the manuscript or you're prepared to help with the writing uh, of the preamble to the research proposal that presumably results in the money, that results in the work being done, that results in the results being uh, being published. Because clearly, if you can offer that kind of service, uh, I would say, great, tell me, <laughs> you know, who has published uh, previously uh, work on the separation of these four arsenic compounds in rice using water's sunfire uh, columns uh, in the iron exchange mode. That may be a little difficult uh, to do. So going back to putting my cynical hat on, you have to read the papers in order to know what people have done. Kind of obvious, right? But I, I suspect a lot of scientists don't actually read the literature. They read the title and maybe they read the abstract. Authors write crappy abstracts. I know that because I've spent the last 30 years of my life reading the abstracts of hundreds of papers in order to try to write review articles. Uh, at least one review article every year has left my desk. I've read hundreds, if not thousands, of abstracts. If you would offer to write the abstract, <laughs> you would be doing everybody not just those of us who write review articles, a huge service. That's assuming we do a better job. Yeah. <laughs> you could not. Sorry. Did you hear Naka's comment? She said, that's assuming that we do a better job. You could not, believe me, do a worse job <laughs> than some of the garbage I read in the current literature. Question here. Right, so the question is, have there been any reports of adverse health uh, effects? Right, so that's a really good question to, to answer, and it's the one that, the, that the, uh, the food industry is definitely going to come up with. So the, let me, how can I, I, I answer uh, this uh, briefly? So let me say that there are plenty of populations around the world that are showing toxic symptoms from the chronic ingestion of arsenic from their drinking water. So I don't think there's any doubt that hundreds of thousands of people are going to die of arsenic-induced cancers in Bangladesh and maybe West Bengal, India, maybe Vietnam, um, Cambodia. Right? The, <clears throat> that's a well-studied uh, situation. There's a group of people in Taiwan who were exposed to arsenic in their drinking water. A lot of what we know about the cancer uh, uh, endpoints from the chronic ingestion of arsenic comes from that particular population. There's no doubt uh, that if you uh, drink arsenic-contaminated water at concentrations that are around about the 100 parts per billion, you will get sick and you may eventually get a cancer and die. The sort of good news is that if you, the source of arsenic is removed, you make a really rapid recovery in the short term. Who knows what the long-term prognosis for some of these populations are? Of course, if you live in Bangladesh, then I don't think the life expectancy, I mean, the population's pretty much undernourished anyway without this business of, of the arsenicosis that they're having to deal with. 
Let me answer the question another way. 25% of all Americans die from cancer. What causes that? Is it arsenic in our foodstuff? Is it cosmic rays and neutrinos from outer space? Is it because we've been breathing the dust that's blown up from dried minerals on the surface of the, of the planet? Maybe we would live to 200 if we could remove these carcinogens from the environment that we eat, breathe, and drink. Nobody knows. So <clears throat> that's why we have something called, or uh, environmental scientists talk about the precautionary principle. So maybe we should be thinking about minimizing our exposure to chemicals that we know that are toxic, even though we don't have a lot of good hard evidence that you're going to die of cancer because you ate a lot of rice uh, in your teenage years. So the answer to your question is no. We don't have evidence that I can present to you that says we know there's a definite link between the arsenic in rice and people dying of lung cancer. We don't have that link. Uh, I'm not sure who got your hand up first, but maybe you could ask us. You didn't get to ask a question already. So the question is, uh, have I come across uh, any studies in which people have tried to make uh, the arsenic compounds less bio-available? Uh, <clears throat> and I think the answer to that is no, um, because that's a really difficult uh, thing uh, to do. But uh, what you can do, uh, if you're concerned about the, the arsenic uh, in the rice, for example, is to cook it in excess water and then throw the excess water away. Sounds really simple, right? We know that hot water will extract uh, almost all of these compounds, almost all of all four compounds. So unfortunately, I don't like rice that's cooked like that. It's kind of soggy, right? So I still cook rice by cooking it in water that is you know, reabsorbed by the time the process is, is over. But you can reduce maybe as much as 50%, uh, the arsenic uh, content. So I have to say that I, I don't think there's anything that you can do. There's some suggestions that if you eat a selenium-containing supplement at the same time as you're taking uh, a high uh, arsenic uh, diet, you can mitigate um, the, the studies. I'll deny I said this if I'm ever, uh, ever asked, but I had a graduate student a few years ago who persuaded a volunteer uh, to eat a foodstuff that we knew was high in arsenic and to take a massive dose of a selenium supplement at the same time. And then to repeat that experiment in which the volunteer only ate the foodstuff high in arsenic and then to do it again when they only took the selenium supplement. So based on the results of one experiment, and then we measured, she measured, uh, the arsenic and selenium content of the volunteer's urine. So we were able to follow the excretion uh, of the arsenic compounds and the selenium compounds as a function of time. So we had very clear evidence that for this individual, uh, the simultaneous ingestion of a high concentration of a selenium uh, dietary supplement, probably selenium-containing yeast, uh, accelerated the excretion of arsenic and increased the amount uh, of arsenic. So we wrote this up despite the fact that I had, you know, sailed under the radar of the human subjects and all that stuff um, for publication, but it was rejected. The, the journal in question said, one person, nah, that's not a study. So we didn't get to publish that result, though it's in the student's dissertation. And there are other studies that, uh, that show that populations that are exposed to arsenic that are given dietary supplements um, including folic acid, I think, is one. 
show a lower uh, incidence of the arsenic-related symptoms. Now, these are serious uh, arsenicosis. So you get so-called Blackfoot disease. Mm -hmm. And they didn't find that association, and the conclusion was that in well-nourished people, they may <clears throat> Yeah, so I don't know enough about, so the, so the comment from over here is that there's a study done uh, by Gilbert Diamond probably at, uh, at University of, of UNH in which they, uh, they gave people a folic acid supplement and then looked at the arsenic in their toenails, right? So arsenic ends up in our hard tissues. So we, you can get some estimate of arsenic status by measuring toenail, fingernail, and hair. Uh, as uh, uh, as well. So it seems that if you're in a, a well-nourished population, you're getting an adequate amount of folate, then there's no uh, benefit. The study I was alluding to, the people who've got the Blackfoot disease and showed some improvement, were definitely uh, an undernourished uh, population uh, that probably didn't have uh, the right amount of mineral supplement or vitamin supplementation. Uh, sorry, there was a question. You, you will defer? Well, I, I share your So the question is, what about the production of, of, uh, of baby cereals by some process that removes the, the arsenic? And I think the answer to that is absolutely, that that could be done. If you read the Consumer Reports article, you'll find that they did interview uh, a director of a company that manufactures baby food. And this, this individual uh, does indicate that his company has responsible food processing practices that do just just that. So the bottom line is probably cost. It costs more to do that. And we as a nation tend to pick the cheapest thing off the supermarket shelf, regardless of the sort of social consequences uh, behind the more expensive uh, item. <clears throat> so. Right, so the, the comment is that, that it's not very widely known uh, that there is a significant amount or a potentially harmful amount of, of these arsenic compounds in, in rice. So I guess you don't read consumer reports. Actually, I don't read consumer reports. I have, if the author of the article hadn't called me and said, can you help uh, with some of the, of the content of this article, I wouldn't have known about it either. And I don't think, I think this one passed under Dr. Oz's radar because I don't think uh, it made it to his TV uh, show either. So if you were all powerful and making decisions going forward, what would the end So if I was all powerful and uh, <laughs> wanted to make decisions going forward, well, first of all, I would fund the Tyson uh, Research uh, uh, Group for uh, a five-year in-depth uh, study of the uh, analytical methodology needed uh, to do that. Um, but I think what you're asking about is what should we do in terms of the, uh, of the arsenic concentration. So I would introduce uh, an arsenic standard in this country, something around about the 100, maybe to 200 parts per billion of inorganic arsenic. So I would say that it would be illegal to sell rice in this country that contained more than 100 micrograms per kilogram of inorganic arsenic. I don't think it's reasonable to say it has to be zero or it, because we can measure such low concentrations these days that we can detect the background concentration. And then, you know, you'd stop eating everything under those circumstances. So despite what I said about living to 200, the other side of the coin is that we've evolved on the surface of a planet that's contaminated with every element and every bio-transformed element in the periodic table. So we are where we are today because we can tolerate, at least we can live to 100 in that kind of environment. So it's quite possible that we can handle small concentrations uh, of arsenic. Incidentally, these arsenic compounds have no known biological function in humans. 
The evidence is that maybe there's some kind of hamster that needs some arsenic to grow a, a, a nice, sleek, thin, uh, glossy coat. But as far as we know, there's no arsenic-containing enzyme or any biomolecule that needs it. It's definitely uh, not uh, a compound, an element that we, that we need. Okay, thank you very much.